My name is Chad Hoover. My name is Brandon Overstreet. My name is Russell Dillon. My name is Alfonso Jack. My name is Lisa Bennett. I'm Jack Snore. Cody Prather here. My name is Matt Ball. My name is Josh Carter. My name is James Bush. My name is Luke Stocking. My name is Jeff Jones. I'm Brian Bolby. My name is Jeff Hodge. My name is Kevin Franklin. My name is uh, Jamie Clancy. My name is Ronnie Ellery. My name is Randy Howell, and you're listening to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Faith in Fishing podcast, bringing you the stories of how God is working in and through fishermen from all around the fishing community. I'm your host Cam, and we are a little late, a lot late getting this episode out, but I am trusting and thankful that y'all are an understanding bunch. I was in the hospital with my family for a few days, and at 10-12 p.m. on March 2nd, my son Henry was born. So I just want to ask that you continue to keep my family in your prayers as we get recovered and learn how our day-to-day flow is going to work best. While we are figuring that out, please bear with me because I can't speak for the consistency or the frequency of new episodes for at least the next few months. But you will still get new episodes though, so don't give up on me. And my goal was to have this particular episode ready and out a long time ago. But if you saw my Instagram post, you already know that I had a few technical difficulties getting this episode ready. Um, So I do apologize for that. And before we get started, I want to give some quick shout outs to Savior Outdoors and their line of rod and gear floats to keep you from losing your stuff. Be sure to use promo code FNFP15 to save 15% on your order from SaviorOutdoors.com and to Vector Hooks, who make the best, most durable, sharpest, rust-free hooks in the business. Check them out at VectorHooks.com. This episode is a good one, so let's get into it. Uh, Not only do we get to speak with author, cancer survivor, and fisher of men, Dan Flowen, we also turn the product spotlight onto my kayak, and we'll get started with that, so let's turn the spotlights on and get into it. So we mentioned it before, but if you follow the podcast Instagram page, which is at Faith and Fishing Pod, for those of you who don't, uh, please go follow it. You have already seen pictures of my kayak. The thing about fishing kayaks is that everyone will tell you a different answer whenever you ask them what the best fishing kayak is, because everyone has different needs. So I started in a 10 foot sun dolphin journey and well, I'm not a little dude. Um, I was really close to the weight capacity without any of my gear and I nearly sank it a few times. That kayak definitely wasn't for me, so I upgraded to a West Marine Pompano 120, which was a 2014 or 2015 model, and was basically the same as the Perception Pescador. I loved that kayak and spent a lot of time in it until I decided to upgrade again because I wanted to be able to stand and fish and have that lawn chair type seat. So I found a Pelican Catch 120 NXT on Facebook Marketplace at a good price, sold my Pompano, and quickly took out new kayak. And I found that being able to stand was nowhere near as important as I thought it was for me. And I found I wasn't enjoying my time on the water because of how slow that kayak was, and because I really had trouble with the poor tracking of that Catch 120. I ended up selling that kayak and started looking again. Uh, Thankfully, I ended up finding the Perception Pescador Pro 120. Now this story is not meant to sell you the Pescador Pro. If anything, the moral of this story is to demo your kayak. So let's get into the stats of the Pescador Pro 120. It's 12 feet long, 32 and a half inches wide, and has a weight capacity of 375 pounds. And it weighs a measly 64 pounds. So let me explain why this kayak is so perfect for me. First is that weight. Uh, I car top on top of an SUV, so even though there were more stable kayaks and more feature-rich kayaks in this price point, I wasn't going to be able to comfortably car top those other kayaks that weighed upwards of 80-90 pounds. Second, uh, and one of my absolute favorite things about this kayak is how well it paddles. It tracks great, it can get up some decent speed whenever it needs to, and it handles just as good in smaller creeks as it does on the main lake. Um, It's very comfortable with a lawn chair type seat, especially with a kayak cushion. It does have a high and low position, uh, but it doesn't raise the seat up very far. Uh, Personally, as strange as it may sound to some of you, I like the low position just because it helps so much with how the boat paddles. Um, Another big thing for me was how easily it can be outfitted with the Fish Finder transducer. 
It already has the screw holes mounted to accept the transducer mount right under the scupper hole at the front of the boat. As far as stability goes, I have never felt uncomfortable even in the middle of a thunderstorm. I have tried standing and have gotten all the way up with a stand assist strap uh, tied around the front handle, but never got to the point where I was comfortable enough to let go of the strap. Um, so if you are someone who has to be able to stand up, this kayak may not be for you. As far as cons go, the only cons are that the boat has a few spots where the water pools um, and the flush mounted quote unquote rod holders are absolutely worthless. Um, as far as um, the cockpit area, I will say that I typically keep the foot pegs, I, I think it's two away from the end and I am... Um, I'm 5'10 with a 30 inch inseam. So if you're someone who's 6'4, this may not fit you. Um, if you, if you have really long legs, this, this cockpit may be a little bit too, too short for you. Uh, but for me, it is perfect. Um, but if you were looking for a boat that paddles like a recreational kayak, uh, with plenty of fishing features and are planning on using your crates rod holders, uh, check out the Pescador Pro 120 from Perception Kayaks. So that's going to do it for the product spotlight. Let's get into introducing the guest for this episode. If you've listened to the podcast before, you probably remember that I work at a bookstore and spend a lot of time reading and reviewing books for publishers and for the store. That is one of the many reasons I was really excited to interview this episode's guest. He's an author, and getting to interview an author about their book is right up my alley. And since Dan's upcoming book, The Fisherman's Apprentice, The Making of a Fisher of Men, is both faith-based and fishing-based, it's also right up the alley of this podcast. So let's jump into our interview with Dan Flowen about his journey that prompted him to write a book. If you want to get a hold of the best hooks in the business, check out Vector Hooks. Vector Hooks is veteran owned and operated and they really go above and beyond with how they treat their customers. They make hooks for all kinds of applications, presentations, baits, and techniques that are stout and strong and with these things being chemically sharpened, let me tell you, their slogan is man these things are sharp for a reason. Check them out today at www.vectorhooks.com. That's V-E-C-T-O-R hooks.com. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate you having me today. Absolutely. So to get us started off, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners? Tell us a little bit about who who Dan Flowen is. Sure thing. Uh, well, I was uh, grew up in the Midwest in Nebraska, and uh, which not a lot of water there, but uh, met my wife in Atlanta some years later, and uh, moved to her hometown here in Tampa, Florida. So we've been here in Tampa for a little over 20 years. I've got one daughter, Laurel, who's uh, a senior at uh, University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, graduating this, this spring. So we, uh, we love our life here in Tampa and, and uh, we're, we're close to the water. So uh, I've been an avid fisherman for many years, but uh, for the last 20, especially been able to have the opportunity to go out a lot more often so we uh, we love it uh, love it here been very blessed absolutely man and what was it that got you into fishing well i guess you could say our our family has has fished for gosh my as long as i can remember our our, our we have a family cabin up in the woods of minnesota so for the first uh, 40 years of my life we we went there every summer, and we still go there every summer and, and fished freshwater. And then, and then we moved here and, and learned a whole different kind of fishing in saltwater. So that was really, really an eye-opener a lot. There's a lot, uh, as, as you know, different, different fishing technique for fresh, freshwater and saltwater. So that's been my, my passion, you know, that and be, just being out in the water and, and boating. Uh, it's been my passion since I can remember. That's awesome. So uh, you've got a book coming out called The Fisherman's Apprentice, The Making of a Fisher of Men. Uh, so why don't you give us an idea of um, of what that book is, is all about um, and give us an idea of what your story is, man. Sure thing. Well, I, I wrote the book for... Uh, to tell a story that God has woven through uh, me and my wife Julie's life. The story 
is about how God takes one stubborn fisherman, uh, who is a really slow learner, by the way, and through a course of events, miraculous events, um, business tragedy, uh, illness, stage four cancer, bankruptcy, a host of events, uh, brings that fisherman to a place where he begins to see that he's on this planet for more than just fishing, that he has a mission, that he should begin to act more like a fisher of men. So I happen to be that fisherman. God gave me uh, a story to tell, and and I am by no means the hero of the book. If it's anybody, it's God, and then a close second would be my wife, Julie. Uh, for the for the support and and the mentoring and coaching that she gave me and still does uh, every day, so uh, I, I I wrote it really for anyone who's gone through a crisis, is in the middle of a crisis, or doesn't know what they're going to do, or maybe isn't sure how they would respond when the next one comes. And um, there's a lot of tools there that I've learned over the years that are in the book that, that God brought to me that have really helped to deal with those, those life challenges and respond to them in faith and, and, and just be, be more obedient. Um, the book is about obedience and, and faith and forgiveness and restoration. And I hope that when people read the book, they're they're going to get hope from that. That no matter what mistakes you make or what, what circumstances you find yourself in, that God is the best father there ever was. And he'll provide for you and protect you. Uh, and he responds to... He responds to your faith and obedience. So obedient acts of faith is uh, there are time and time again in the book where, you're, where, where, where you will read that uh, God responds to obedient steps of faith. And I uh, just hope readers uh, really, really gain some hope from that in whatever circumstance they may be in now or, or, or in the future. Absolutely. I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm, I work at a bookstore and I am, um, I'm all about some, some books and some book reviews. So I am, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on it for sure. Um, and, uh, for listeners who, um, are, are also interested, um, give us an idea of, uh, of how they can get their hands on it and when. Sure thing. Um, actually on March 19th, um, you could mark your calendar for that day. That'll be the, the uh, pre-launch day where we will have a 99 cent sale on March 19th um, to get the ebook version of the book. And then probably about three to four weeks after March 19th, the paperback version will be out and available on Amazon and, and other places. So, but March 19th is the, really the pre-launch date we want to try to get as, um, as much uh, attention that day as we can to just really gain some momentum but then and then uh, look for the paperback about a month after that absolutely and you've touched on it a little bit already but um, if you were to break it down in a nutshell what is it that you believe in what is it that I believe in wow I believe in the power of relationships and and God in that so um, God has has taught me number one if you want to if you if you want things to go well start with a relationship with with the Lord understand who he is and how he is what is his mo um, he 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 wrote his autobiography, in my mind, the Bible was his, is his autobiography. If you want to learn about who God is, just read, read the Bible, um, and you'll un you'll begin to understand, as I did, and and I'm still learning every day, how to understand who God is, and 
the better I understand who God is and what his character is, the better I know how to expect him to react in, in various ways. Um, I, I, you know, he's a loving father. There are things that I can expect of him knowing that he's a loving father, that he's going to allow me to experience pain, but he does it in a way that I'm going to grow with it, go grow through it. He uses those things to, to build character and faith. And so I, I believe a, a, a strong relationship and knowledge of who God is, is I think the basis for uh, our very lives really here on this planet. And why, why did he put us here? He, he put us here to, to honor him and love, love his, his, his creation, his people. So, you know, I, I think the context of the, the, the book, the, the fisher of men, fisherman's apprentice, the context of that is that God, really gave some pretty simple instructions, love him and love your neighbor, love others. And so, you know, many people, I think Christians uh, get intimidated at the word evangelism or being a minister or, you know, they think that, you know, maybe being a fisher of men means I've got to go beat somebody over the head with a Bible on the street corner. And, and, and certainly those things have been effective. Um, but, but my understanding of it is that first and foremost, God calls us into relationship with him first and then with, with his children second. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think, what, what the basis of the book is about, how, how, to, how to build that relationship, be in a faithful, obedient relationship with the Lord, and then and then where he brings you from there is learning how to relate to people. Absolutely. And, um, and so I was, uh, I heard you on, um, the salt strong podcast, um, yesterday. That's how I found out about you. And so I got to hear a little bit of your story, um, through that. Uh, so you were actually, um, given eight months to live, um, and, um, you mentioned earlier stage four cancer, um, kind of give the listeners an idea of, of what that is like and how that affects your faith and, um, and how you were able to lean on your faith to get you through that. Yeah. So back in 2007, I was told I had stage four metastatic melanoma, uh, I had cancer in both adrenal glands, um, in my bones, several other places, um, soft tissue areas in my body, probably uh, eight or ten locations at that point. And I was given eight months to live. And so, um, boy, that was a that was a, a, a surreal uh, day when I got told that. And, you know, you you. I guess what I've learned is you, 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 you don't get any more close to God than on the day that you're told you've got eight months to live. Um, those, those, those crisis moments tend to draw you to the, to the Lord. And what I, what I learned in that experience uh, was, first of all, I was not in control of the outcome. It was very obvious to me that I was not in control of the outcome. And so I leaned into God heavier than I ever have in my life there. And I would, I would tell you that looking back, even though that was extremely uh, stressful, it was a hard time um, doing massive, heavy chemo treatments, looking like an Auschwitz survivor, gray, bald. Um, I would tell you that that is, was also the most vibrant times of our lives for me and Julie, because we felt so close to God and in tune with him because we spent more time, um, with, with him in prayer, uh, in daily devotions, reading the Bible with good Christian friends to help us understand and uh, process what's happening here. Um, and so, 
you know, we really, really leaned on our faith there, knowing that we had no real direct control over the outcome and that, and that our, our number one objective, it became very clear. You know, we, 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 we heard a message from God, both Julie and I ind- independently. And we heard that little small voice say, it's going to get really ugly and then it's going to get better after that. And we, we took, we took a great amount of hope from that. Um, and it certainly did get ugly. Um, but s- when we got that leading from him, we, it then became pretty, pretty simple in that all we really needed to do was whatever God said, you know, if, if, if God gave us an, an instruction, my job was to follow it fully and immediately without question. So if I was sure it was him, or it was very clear to me through his word or through a devotion or prayer that, that I was given an instruction. And some of the instructions I got, I can tell you, sounded absolutely ridiculous to me hmm. as a human being. But I followed them, and in every case, God responded with some sort of provision, some sort of healing, uh, some kind of a blessing. He responded to that, to that step of obedient faith. And so it seems like, it seems like the times that, I guess for me, faith comes easiest is when you have no control over the outcome. We like to think us guys, you know, being a guy, I'm a fixer. I like to, I fix things, you know, um, I think I'm in control most of the time. And that doesn't take much faith on a day-to-day basis. But when you have no control over the circumstance, that's, you know, that, that's where faith comes in. And, uh, and that was a huge learning for me. I, I say uh, in the book, I, I, I mentioned where people over the years have told me what a great fighter I am. And, and I tell them I stopped fighting. I surrendered. And what I mean by that is I surrendered to God's plan. You know, we all have our own script that we'd like our life to go by. And when things happen that are outside of that script, we, you know, we may turn to some other, um, bad habits you know that's where some other uh, bad behaviors might come from but but if the learning was to surrender to God's plan and when I did that when I finally got that um, the provision the healing the restoration began to take place That's awesome. So, um, when was it that you, um, and correct me if, if it hasn't happened yet, but when was it that you found out you were in remission? Actually, it was just a little over a year ago. So from 2007 till 2021, um, quite a few years that, that the cancer was in my body at some level. And there was a time that I was convinced that God was going to leave some amount of cancer in my body for the rest of my life. And the reason I thought that is because it had become very clear to me that cancer, this whole thing was never about cancer. My story, the book is not about cancer. Cancer is just one lever that God used to, to get my attention and, and develop my faith. And I was convinced that God was going to leave some cancer there so that he could keep my attention, uh, for the rest of my life. Um, because as I said, I'm a pretty slow learner. I need a lot of repetition. 
And um, what I learned later was that I guess the mistake in my thinking was that I thought I needed to be perfect. I thought I needed to do every single thing God said, just as he said, absolutely 100% perfect, or, or he would not heal me. Because until I was perfect, he was going to need to have that, that influence. He was going to have to use that lever on me to keep my attention. And the, the realization that I came to as he continued to heal me over years was that just as Jesus died for us while we, while we were still sinning, God heals people even when they're still sinning, even when they're not perfect. You know, none of us are perfect. We never will be. That was my mistake in thinking. I thought that, I thought that if I were, if I were perfect, if I could do everything just so, then, then God would heal me completely and I would be in remission. But I'm still not perfect, never will be, and God healed me anyway. Awesome. Man, that is a, that is a powerful story, and I definitely don't want to make light of it, but I do, I do want to ask the question. Um, so as someone who has lived it, how accurate is the Tim McGraw song, Live Like You're Dying? <laughs> it's changed my perspective for sure. You know, at the beginning of this, of this story um, that the book is about, I thought that it was about business success or financial success, or I identified myself as not only a fisherman, but, but my, but my lifestyle defined me. And so everything I did, it seemed was to that end. And I didn't spend much time or enough time uh, at all in relationship building, um, time with the Lord, valuing people, uh, valuing the precious time we have. You know, after this, like Tim McGraw says, live, live as though you're dying. Um, it, it definitely has changed my perspective. I am not, uh, I guess I look at the way I spend my money differently. I look at the way I spend my time differently. Um, I look at the, I look at my relationships differently. And so my my mission in life is not to make money and have the most toys at the end. And I wouldn't have told you that even, you know, 15 years ago, but that's the way I was acting. If an outsider looking in would have said he wants to have the most money and the most toys at the end, at the end of his day, at the end of his days, because that's what shows. Right. And now I hope that, what shows is a concern for people and an availability to spend time um, that I that I didn't have before. So it, it really really shifted my priorities. And so that that you know every day I I pray for an opportunity with someone. You know, just Lord, give me an opportunity with someone today. Um, just to just to spend time with someone today and maybe maybe share a little of the hope that that God gave me along the way. If we can do that on a fishing boat, even better. Absolutely. And I do want to get a chance to talk some fishing with you. Um, and um, like you said, your perspective has changed. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to your answer to this question. But uh, 
What fishing story or memory means the most to you? I always try to ask all of my guests that. So, um, what fishing story or memory means the most to you? Hmm. Well, I, I tell the story in the book, and there's there's been a couple or three in 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 my life, but and the story is about my partner and co-founder of our company, Eric, who about six months in or so, maybe actually it was less than that, I think, um, into our my diagnosis, he sprung for a trip to go yellowfin tuna fishing off the coast of Louisiana with my dad and his dad. And the words were never spoken, but I think we both were thinking that that might be the last time we fish together, or that we ho we hoped that weren't that wasn't the case. But I we wanted to make sure that we got to go do this before I was gone. Right. And so that was really, that was really special. The, you know, we, we caught some really nice fish that day. I, I just got lucky and hooked about an eight foot Mako shark that, which, which was just a great fight, you know, a lot of fun. Um, just a great day on, great day on the water. Um, happily, I'm still here and we've had a lot of fishing trips since then, but that one really meant a lot to me at that time. Absolutely. So, um, given what you've been through, man, what life advice do you wish you had been able to start off with? I wish I would have had or used better the tools that I've learned over the years. Two of them in particular is journaling. Um, I said to myself, well, you know, I'm not going to do that. That's a, That sounds too much like a diary to me. I'm a man's man. I don't <laughs> write diaries. And after months of prodding, one of my Christian mentors convinced me to start journaling. And that was really a huge blessing because it was only about nine months before my terminal diagnosis that I had begun to journal. <clears throat> and that I think was God's providence as well, that he, he brought that to me to be able to look back at the many, many, many times that God has provided for me, rescued me, blessed me in some way. So, you know, we, we humans, we've got really short memories. We, we don't seem to remember the last crisis. You know, it was just last week when, when God did something amazing for me, but that was last week. Now it's this week and I've got a new crisis that I'm dealing with. And so a, a spiritual journal, I think is a huge tool that I wish I would have had a lot earlier. Um, I also think that the amount of stress and anxiety over trying to live to my own script and live to my plan in many ways caused my illness. We all know that stress and anxiety is not healthy for a human body. God doesn't want us to be anxious. He, how many times did he tell us in the Bible, don't, don't be afraid, don't worry. And I wish I would have had that a lot, a lot sooner. That would have really helped. And then the second thing is, being a part of an accountability group among, you know, among uh, some Christian men. And I say men only because there are things that, that men struggle with that they need to talk to other men with that may not be comfortable for men to talk about in front of uh, mixed company. And so I write about that in the book as well. You know, I'm, I'm a red blooded American man. Uh, you know, I, I think about things that a lot of men struggle with and I did too and still still do. So, you know, these are these are daily 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 challenges that we have and so being a part of an accountability group helps 
helps keep me accountable. I know that I know that if I have a tr- if I'm struggling in my, in my thought life, or if I I do something out of line, I lie, I whatever I do, uh, I make some kind of some kind of a misjudgment and a relationship. I know that I'm going to be asked those questions. How did I do last week by my accountability partners? And so having that knowledge very oftentimes helps me to stay within the buoys in life because I know that I'm going to have to ask, answer that question next week when I meet with, with my guys. So uh, those, are, those are two of my most valuable um, tools I wish I would have had a lot earlier. And uh, things, I, think, I think things could have gone a lot smoother for me. <laughs> For sure. And what about fishing advice? Is there a particular piece of fishing advice you wish you had been able to start off with? <laughs> it's the oldest advice in the world, but it seemed like it took me forever to to actually get it. And it's don't leave fish to find fish. <laughs> you know, uh, being uh, a kid, you know, growing up in Minnesota, there's a lot of good fishing in Minnesota. And I was a very impatient fisher man and i i'd stay over a, a spot and, and and i just i don't know i guess i would use it i was just antsy i i couldn't stay in one spot long enough to 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 really uh um, do the best in that area i'd have to go off to the next spot so i think that same thing is you know it's true in life right you know when when god is blessing you and you're in a good spot in life why on earth would you strike off on some other tangent entirely when God has you right where he wants you. And so that was a big lesson for me, uh, you know, particularly now being a saltwater fisherman, there's so much more that goes into it in, in my mind uh, on the saltwater. You've got to, you got to keep in mind the tide and, you know, the, the moon phase and uh, just, you know, temperature, all the rest. And so, man, when you find a good spot, um, to the extent that you're, you, you, of course, you don't want to overfish a spot either. You don't want to overpressure the spot. But uh, why would you, why would you pick up anchor and uh, and head off to another area um, when you're in a good spot right there? For sure. And um, I've got to ask: Is there a particular fish that sits at the top of your bucket list you haven't caught yet? I would say, and this is not even not nowhere in my area here in the bay, but I've never caught a sailfish. That would be something I'd I'd love to do. I've I was party to a blue marlin once. I was not the guy who ultimately brought it to the boat. I was the first man on the reel. But uh, I've always something about a billfish, a sailfish, or a marlin. I just, just that's that's just really cool. I I love the idea of, of doing that. I've never done that, um, and I, I I can't do that in my waters. I would need to go somewhere else to do that. But uh, pretty rare out here in the Gulf of Mexico. It's too shallow. But I suppose there's a few out there, but it's pretty rare. So okay. that, that'd be one that I'd like to do. Absolutely. I've always thought it would be really, really fun to hook into something that can outrun my car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And what about a particular fishing spot? You get to fish a lot of a lot of spots that sit at the top of my bucket list. But is there a particular fo- uh, fishing spot that you you want to fish at? You know, uh, in terms of the. The tight, one of my favorite fish out of the, the bay here is gag grouper, a fresh grouper out of the bay. It's just, I just, it's just unbeatable. It's just so good. And so one of my favorite, I guess I'll call it a spot, but it's more like an area. We fish the, the shipping channels in the bay. Uh, right on the edge of those shipping channels and that's where those those a lot of those gag grouper will pile up on the rock piles um, it's a limestone bottom and so you know they came and blasted those 
those channels, there's some big boulders down on the bottom. And so we typically will troll with downriggers along that shipping channel. And when the bite is on, uh, you know, we've, we've had some days where we've caught over 30 fish in a matter of just a couple, three hours. So uh, that's a lot of fun. They pull really hard and they're just so good for, uh, uh, to eat as well. So that's, that's one of my favorite things to do. Okay, absolutely. So with all of our guests, we always do a segment. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's called What's Your Favorite? But I'm going to ask your favorite in a few different categories. Sure. All right. So to start it off, uh, do you have a favorite scripture? Well, it's a, yeah, it's the whole chapter of Psalm 91. And uh, talks about living under the shelter of the Almighty. And what happens when when you do that and he covers you with his wings and uh, protects you from the fiery arrows and it's it's the entire chapter psalm 91 is i took a lot of hope from that you know though ten thousand are falling around you these these uh these things will not will not harm you um, just all kinds of words of encouragement and protection from the Lord in Psalm 91. That's awesome. And what about a favorite Bible story? <laughs> um, probably it, it, less so much a story than a person, and it's, it's King David. I take a lot sure. of hope in knowing that King David made some colossal mistakes and he was still referred to by God himself as a man after his own heart and so I take a lot of hope in that I've I've made some mistakes um, and I I I hope to be known one day as a man after God's own heart like David was Absolutely. And um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you may have already uh, already answered this one. But what's your favorite fish to catch? I think tarpon is my favorite. I, I wish I knew how to target them more consistently. But whenever I have had one on the line, that is just pandemonium and a thrill for me. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and what about a favorite fish to fish for? I would have to say, uh, as I said before, grouper. That's that's got to be my favorite. Just just because of the 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 strength of these fish, they're they fight so hard, and they are so good on the dinner table as well. Well, speaking of the dinner table, uh, would that be your favorite fish to eat? Oh, yes. By far. Yeah. Absolutely. I have had grouper and I do really enjoy it. I don't know if I had gag grouper, but I had grouper. Yeah, it's so uh, it's just a white, fluffy, you know, not very firm. It's just doesn't not fishy at all. Um, boy, just any any number of ways to prepare it. I just we just we've got several recipes that we like. Even just a just a grouper sandwich is is pretty pretty hard to beat. Absolutely. And speaking of food, what's your favorite fish and snack? I'm sorry. Uh, what's your favorite fishing snack? Fishing snack. Oh, probably uh, the pretzel sticks. I I love having a pretzel stick in my mouth when I okay. when I'm out there on the boat. You know, a little bit of a little bit of pretzel, maybe some iced tea and and. Uh, something to have in your mouth while you're while you're uh wetting the line absolutely and i won't ask for any gps coordinates or any <laughs> secret spots but what's your favorite body of water to fish uh two actually um and it's just based on experience i think um uh, first being the gulf of mexico I, I think you see uh, just just off of Tampa Bay, 
you see so much ocean life out there. I just really love being out there. The you know the emerald water, and the further out you go, the bluer it gets. That's just I think a fantastic uh, nature environment. You know that's that's just that's God's creation. Um, on steroids out there. I love it out there. And then my second would be um, the lake that I grew up fishing on, uh, Clithra Lake up in Minnesota. It's just uh, uh, that's a different, that's a completely different opposite end of the spectrum, but you wake up and you've got loons calling in the morning and it's just, uh, uh, if you ever saw the movie on Golden Pond, that's what it reminds me of. It's just, just, just a beautiful place. For sure. And I don't want, uh, again, I don't want you to have to give away too many secrets, but uh, whenever you're out uh, fishing with lures, what's your favorite lure to throw? Well, because I'm a grouper fan and we troll for grouper, the, the, the biggest, my, my most frequent lure that I use is just a lead head jig um, with about an eight inch swim tail. Usually I use scented swim tails, either yellow or chartreuse and uh, or hot pink. And so the whole bait is probably, oh, probably nine or 10 inches long when it's put together and it swims through the water. I think when they look at that, I think it, they think it must look like a squid. Um, I mean, this grouper loves squid. So uh, pretty, pretty basic. Um, but grouper love them. Absolutely. And last but not least, what's your favorite time of year to fish? I think right about now in the springtime. Um, it's not too terribly hot yet here down in Florida. The water is starting to warm. So say like March, April, May is um, you've got different species of fish starting to work their way into the bay you've got tarpon coming in as early as may so uh that's that's in my mind uh my favorite time i like to you know, get out there when the when the when the water is around 70 degrees 75 or so that's that's a comfortable temperature for just about every species in the bay and um uh, and it's not too terribly hot to be on the boat at that time either. It's just beautiful out there. Absolutely. Well, we're going to start wrapping things up. So um, now that you have your book finished and it's coming out, uh, what's next for you? I think uh, we'll see what God does, but I've, I, I've, I've made my time available for, speaking engagements if they come up i've i have spoken on several occasions over the years at various venues um you know god god gave me a, a story to tell and i think it's a good one i'm hoping i am i'm hoping and praying that the writing does the story justice um because it is a i think a, a story that needs to be told and so if there are speaking opportunities out there that that come up i'd that would that would be one thing I'd I'd love to have the opportunity because I feel it's part of my part of the reason I'm still here why why God left me here is to tell this story and so speaking is one way to do that um, I've considered working on a a follow up book as well not exactly sure what that would be yet um, but um, I, I I see myself as However, it is is to is to to look for more opportunities, more and more different opportunities to to share the story that God has given me to tell. Absolutely. And do you have any sponsors or supporters or just uh, anyone you want to thank? Give shout outs. Well, shout out to my uh, my wife's uh, for first and foremost, Julie. Uh, she's uh, I believe was an instrument of God's healing and one of the very big reasons I'm still on this planet on the right side of the grass. Um, so, um, and for her support, I, I tell about some things in the book that um, maybe are hard to, hard to talk about and, and 
and we talked about whether we put those things in the book. And she was in full support of that because it's it's part of the story that God gave us to tell. So uh, certainly Julie, and then and then also my my editor Julie Brehan, um, who's um, just was so good at 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 helping me sound better as a writer. Okay. Without without taking away my voice, I you know it, it still sure. sounded like me in the book, I think, but she certainly made me look like a better writer than I am. So I (laughs) appreciate her help with that. Absolutely. That's super important. All right. And if our listeners um, want to uh, follow you on social media, learn more about Fisherman's Apprentice, uh, point them towards where to follow you, where to find you, website, all of that good stuff. Yes, absolutely. I, I would say the, the number one place to go would be uh, go out to danflowen.com, D-A-N-F-L-O-E-N.com. That is my author website. And on that website, there'll be a button where you can um, be added to the list to be alerted when the book is available. So if you want to push that button, just give me your name and email address and that way when the uh, when the book is out, um, not only on March 19th, I'll send an announcement out that hey, it's out there. It's an, it, for 99 cents that day on it for an ebook. But then when the paperback also becomes available, uh, I'll send out a, an announcement to everybody that's on the list then as well. So I'm out on uh, Facebook, uh, Dan Flowen, and uh, also I've got a Facebook page for Fisherman's Apprentice as well but danflowing.com is probably the the one place i would i would direct you to and and uh, uh that's where you can learn more about the book and and get on the list to be alerted when the book is out absolutely well uh dan thank you so much for your time i've really enjoyed it um, i don't get to talk to as many uh saltwater people on here as i would like so it was it was awesome to have you man well, thank you so much cam uh, appreciate you doing this and uh god bless you when you're when you in your podcast i think it's just a fantastic uh topic uh uh, that you're talking about faith and fishing there's there's a lot of faith in fishing i think absolutely well thank you again and uh and you take care man okay thanks cam take care god bless you hey y'all just wanted to take a quick minute to tell you about my friends over at savior outdoors Savior makes retrieval devices for fishing rods, action cameras, and bow fishing bows to give you peace of mind out on the water. Attach this out-of-the-way compact float on your gear, and when, not if, it ends up in the water, it releases a float so you can get it back. And reload kits get your device ready for your next outing. Head on over to SaviorOutdoors.com, that's S-A-V-U-R Outdoors.com, to learn more and hit the shop tab and use promo code FNFP15 to save on your order. Another huge thank you to Dan for coming on the show and sharing his amazing story with us. If you want to learn more about Dan and get updates on his book, The Fisherman's Apprentice, The Making of a Fisher of Men, the best place to do that will be in the show notes and it is www.danflowen.com. That's D-A-N-F-L-O-E-N.com. Uh, be sure to check out faithinfishing.wixsite.com slash podcast to keep up with the blog, the podcast, and to see the store and to purchase some Faith and Fishing merch. And if you already have some, tag the show on Instagram and a picture of you wearing it. Also, be sure to check out SaviorOutdoors.com and use promo code FNFP15 at checkout for 15% off of your purchase. And VectorHooks.com for the last brand of hooks you'll ever use. I also want to encourage you to join the community. Head on over to Facebook and join the Faith and Fishing group. The link will be in the show notes and get in on a group of fishermen who are praying for each other and encouraging each other. That's going to do it for this episode. Thanks for sticking through to the end and for bearing with me. Y'all take care and God bless. Thank y'all for listening to the Faith and Fishing podcast. Be sure to give us a rating and a review if you enjoy the show. And follow the show on Instagram at Faith and Fishing Pod or at Facebook.com slash Faith and Fishing. Be sure to reach out to one of the amazing pastors in your community if you have questions about faith. And make sure you join the Faith and Fishing community on Facebook. Special thanks goes to Tyler Worrell, the graphic designer behind the Faith and Fishing logo. The Faith and Fishing podcast is produced by Cam Steele, and the music for the show is written, recorded, and performed by Jonathan Influenzi and Cam Steele. 
Thanks again for listening. Y'all take care and God bless.